This is session number 11 of Introduction to Christian Doctrine. I'm Dr. John McMath, and I'm together with uh, a whole crowd of uh, uh, my friends in the Philippines and in Italy. It's uh, good to see everyone uh, this morning, this evening, whatever time it is where you are. Uh, today we're going to uh, to continue in uh, anthropology, the uh, the uh, uh, the doctrine of. Uh, let's see here. I've got to get, make something move here. Okay, uh, anthropology is the doctrine of man, who man is, what man is made of, how how man. Uh, fits into the overall purposes of God. Now, for the most part, honestly, this is not terribly controversial, uh, but today we're going to get into something that over the centuries has turned out to be controversial. Uh, and um, I'm going to tell you up front that I think it's a silly controversy, uh, but it's still, it's something that, that people argue about. Uh, so I'll, I'll show you the positions and I'll tell you what my position is. Uh, and if you want to argue with me, that's, that's great. You're, you're following a long uh, and uh, honored tradition of arguing about something that frankly doesn't matter very much. Anyway, we're going to start off with the composition of man. As, uh, that's the, the title of this session. We're going to look at the composition of man and then at the transmission of the immaterial part of man. When a human being is conceived, uh, we know obviously where the physical part comes from. That comes from mom and dad. But where does the spiritual part of man come from? Uh, the, the part of me that lives forever that is not made of flesh and bone. Hmm. Well, that is a bit of a problem. And, uh, both of these uh, uh, issues uh, have a long tradition. Uh, and uh, both of these issues have a whole lot of Latin terms that, that go with them. Uh, I think you'll find most of it review. <laughs> but let's go ahead and get, get started. Uh, so the composition of man, we'll start off uh, by uh, asking the question. This is from a uh, theology called, uh, by Erickson. When we ask about what humankind or mankind is, we are asking several different questions. One, which we've already addressed is the question of where humans came from. How did they come into being? And obviously, mankind came into being by direct creation. Uh, that's uh, Genesis 1 through 3. Uh, but human makeup, uh, what is man composed of, is another question. And it comes down to the question, are we a unitary whole or made up of two or more components? And if multiple components, what are they? Okay. Uh, Hamlet, actually Shakespeare in Hamlet Act 2, Scene 2, says it this way. What a piece of work is a man. <laughs> Mankind is a, is a fascinating thing. It's a fascinating study. So there's various views of um, how, to, how to look at the makeup of man. And here's a guy in a business suit. He's uh, ready to go to work in some some big company where he'll end up having to sit at a desk all day. Uh, I, I'm not sure I, I want a job like that. Anyway, that, there he is. Uh, monism is the view that a man is made up of one thing. He's just a human being. And there's, uh, there's no more there. In philosophy, the term uh, monism is the concept that all reality is one thing or one being, and it denies the distinction between God and 
creation. And that's not really what we're talking about here. In theology, the concept that human beings are not to be thought of as in any sense composed of parts or separate entities, but rather as a radical unity, radical in the mathematical sense. Uh, so uh, a man isn't made up of body, soul, spirit, heart, mind, whatever. Uh, he, he's just human being and everything is all wrapped up in a single package. Uh, the, uh, the monist suggests that the various biblical terms are just different ways of referring to the man himself, the self. Uh, very, very few uh, evangelicals are monist. Mostly we go to a different uh, direction. Uh, the second view is what is called dichotomy. It's from a uh, 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 Latin word, it means two part. Uh, di is two, and I'm not sure what cotomus would have to do with, but uh, dichotomy means uh, the idea that uh, uh, men and women are made up of two parts a physical part, body, and the spiritual part, which is the soul. Uh, and uh, the uh, view of dichotomy was the common view in the very early church, uh, that the, the soul and the body are uh, separate entities. Uh, and this led to a number of different conclusions, but none of which are very important for our, our point. Uh, the evidence for this, oh, let's see. Uh, ah. It's a Greek word, not a Latin word. Dika is to an temno, okay, to cut. Okay, it could be. I think uh, there's maybe a different uh, uh, etymology that we could use. But humans are composed of two parts, body and soul. Uh, so we have both a material and an immaterial element. Uh, the ancient Greeks, like Plato, rejected monism altogether and distinguished body and soul. Uh, so in the creation account, the evidence for this, uh, the Lord God formed a man from of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostril, nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. When he was formed from the dust of the ground, his body existed, but his life force is a separate existence that was breathed into his nostrils by God. So the life force or the soul, uh, that's, that's good. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the two parts here are simply assumed. A little more, the biblical evidence for uh, dichotomy is all over the place. The terms soul and spirit in the Bible are used interchangeably. Uh, so it came about in the morning, his spirit was troubled. Okay, what was troubled? Well, his spirit was troubled. We might say your mind is troubled or your soul is troubled and it would mean the same thing. That's Genesis 41. Uh, in uh, Psalm 42, oh my God, my soul is in despair within me. Well, which is it? Where, where does the trouble happen? In my soul or in my spirit? And frankly, the words are used interchangeably. The spirits of righteous men made perfect in Hebrews 12. So, okay, that's the part of me that's made perfect. And I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who'd been slain because of the word of God. Revelation 6, 9. So which is it that goes to heaven, the spirits or the souls? Or maybe it's the same, same idea. So the dichotomous view argues that there, there is a material and an immaterial. Uh, and there is no need for any further uh, dissection of the spiritual part of us. Okay, a little more biblical evidence. Scripture describes the whole person as soul or spirit plus a body. Uh, do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. 
Okay. For I on my part in 1 Corinthians, though absent in body and present in spirit. Okay, so which is it, spirit or soul, as we see. There's another view uh, that became popular in the 19th century. And we, I, I still find a lot of people who hold this view uh, because it, uh, uh, it answers some questions. The trichotomy view, tri means three, uh, trico three, and uh, tomo to cut, to cut in three pieces, uh, argues that there is a body, a soul, and a spirit. Uh, three separate ideas. This is a well-known, widely held view in the early church, and it became quite popular among conservatives uh, in the 1800s. Okay, so man is a three-part being, body, soul, and spirit. Usually the soul or the suke in Greek is seen as the life force. And the spirit or pneuma in Greek is the spiritual part of a man able to relate to God. The soul makes us alive. The spirit makes us alive to God. Okay. The biblical evidence is that scripture so does sometimes use a threefold division. Uh, for example, 1 Thessalonians 5. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's Paul who elsewhere seems to put soul and spirit together, but here he separates them. Well, why is that? Well, some would say, well, that was deliberate. He wanted to make sure we all understood. <laughs> The word of God pierces as far as the division of soul and spirit. This is Hebrew 4.12, Hebrews 4.12. Uh, joints and marrow, judging the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Okay. Uh, oh, I'm going to put a little bug in the, uh, the side of this argument for a second, uh, because here we have thoughts and heart. Uh, so we're dividing soul and spirit, but while we're at it, we're also judging thoughts and heart. Um, uh, are thoughts and heart a part of the soul or a part of the spirit, or are they something else? At any rate, the trichotomist says, no, no, there's, there's three. There's the, there's the body, the soul, and the spirit. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2, Paul distinguishes between the fleshly and the soulish and the spiritual. Uh, sort of. Yeah, he kind of does. Um, and uh, uh, that 1 Corinthians 2 is one of those places that we all have trouble with, but it's interesting. He, he may be saying that, then again, he may not. A fourth view is what we call multifaceted. A multifaceted object has many faces. Uh, it's, uh, there's a lot going on. It's a complex thing. Uh, so this young lady here has a body, which is complex. It's got arms and legs and head and toes or whatever. Uh, she also has a soul. There's a life force within her. And the soul is complex. Ah, so if I've got a body and I've got a soul and both of them are complex, that means everything is made up of parts. This view accepts that man is basically composed of two substances, a material and an immaterial. And that those two substances are made up of many different facets. They are complex. Uh, so the many facets of the material, many facets of the immaterial join up, join together to make up the whole of each person. So in my body, I, I have heart, lungs and legs and feet and whatnot. Uh, in my soul, uh, I have a heart, a mind, I have emotions, I have a will. Uh, there, there are lots of stuff going on in the spiritual side of me. Uh, 
so this is a this is a view taken by uh, by quite a few. Uh, 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 Charles Ryrie uh, takes this view. Uh, this this little guy is uh, really really little, uh, and uh, he's he's being held by a nurse. Uh, I I think this is a good picture. Uh, thou didst form my inward parts. Thou didst weave me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are thy works, my soul knows it well. My frame was not hidden from thee when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. <laughs> you know, I have fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm, I'm a lot more complex than you would think. Uh, this is another psalm. Thine eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in thy book they were all written, the days that were ordained for me when there was yet not one of them. Okay, this little guy is an extraordinarily complex design. God created him uh, in precisely the way he is. Uh, and he will grow up to be a fully complex human being with all of the bits and pieces, all of the parts, uh, and, uh, his uh, body, soul, spirit, mind, emotions, will, all of it together. Uh, all, of, all of this makes up a human being. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm of the multifaceted school of thought. Anyway, let's look at the, uh, the, the biblical terms themselves uh, because uh, they, they are important and they, uh, uh, everything teaches us a little something. Uh, the word soul in Hebrew is nefesh. Uh, it, uh, it comes out in, uh, in Yiddish as nebesh. It means a, a, a man or a human being. A nebesh is somebody who stands up like a man. Uh, the the word the Hebrew word uh, nefesh means uh, a living being. So in Genesis two seven, when God breathed into man the breath of life, he became a nefesh. He became a living being, uh, and there was a uh, life within him. In Greek, the word is suke. Uh, we get our word psychology from uh, suke. Uh, this is equal to the soul or even to the whole person. Uh, so then those who had received his word were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Does that mean the souls were separated from the bodies? And they were all killed that day? And the, No. <laughs> no, this is, this is converts. And, and the... the uh, when an individual comes to Christ, the whole person comes to Christ. Body, soul, spirit, mind, emotion, the whole thing comes. To, <laughs> the whole is not, is not merely the soul uh, that is saved. The whole person is saved. Uh, and uh, the term soul usually refers to the whole person. Uh, sometimes it's more specific. Uh, there are certain traits that are ascribed to the soul. Uh, for instance, Psalm 43 speaks of uh, despair. My soul despairs within me. Uh, despair is a lack of faith, really. It's, uh, it's where you come when you realize that there's nothing more you can count on. Uh, hate happens in the soul. 2 Samuel 5 uh, is a, a good illustration of, of that. Uh, the Song of Solomon, uh, 1-7. Uh, speaks of love as having its uh, as basis in the soul. Uh, Jeremiah speaks of uh, a grief happening within his soul. Uh, so lots of different kinds of emotions uh, happen within the soul, and the, the soul is a uh, the soul is the life force within us. It's also the it's also the whole being. And let's see here. So the, the soul is this animating life force that's within each human being. That's, that's pretty clear. Uh, the, the term spirit uh, is a little different. 
the Hebrew word is uh, ruach, uh, the Greek is pneuma, and uh, they're used interchangeably. Uh, we see the uh, uh, the word he, uh, ruach in Hebrew being translated by pneuma in the Greek Old Testament. Uh, so it's the same word, basically. Uh, it can be translated wind, not usually, but once in a while it is. Uh, breath. So when God breathed uh, life into uh, uh, Adam and he became a living uh, being, a living nephesh, uh, the word ruach in its uh, verb form is used. Uh, so it could be wind or breath, or it could be spirit. Uh, the spirit, kind of an interesting word. Uh, this uh, re, uh, refers to the immaterial uh, part of a man. Uh, and interestingly, it is always the non-material parts of a man. Never, as with the soul, to the whole person. Okay. Uh, so we can really make a distinction between spirit and soul in that way. Um, various traits are ascribed to the spirit. For example, thinking in Isaiah or remembering in Psalm 77, uh, humility in uh, Matthew 5, and grief in Genesis 26. Okay. Uh, now, some of these things also happen in the, uh, uh, in the soul. Uh, so, you know, where, where does it happen and does it really matter? Uh, there does seem to be some distinction, some contrast between soul, which is mere life, and spirit, which is spiritual life in uh, Paul's thought. Uh, I, I personally think you have to hold your nose just right to uh, catch that. Uh, but uh, many interpreters do see a bit of a contrast there. But I think uh, that if it were identical, Paul would have used the same word. So again, a multiplicity of things going on. There's some other biblical terminology that's important. I'll talk about the word heart. Uh, this is a very comprehensive term, both testaments. Uh, in, uh, Psalm 119 your word have I hidden or treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. Okay, we're busy. Are we talking about the physical pump in our chest? Well, no. When you do memory work, it's happening in your head. So the, the heart is some kind of an immaterial center of thought. And there's something going on there. Uh, emotions, apparently. I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart, Romans 9, as is Paul speaking. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the, the emotion is not merely in the soul and the spirit, it's also in the heart. Well, what's the difference between them? We don't know. Uh, volition or the uh, decision-making function of a uh, of man. Uh, Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he didn't listen to them as the Lord had said and Pharaoh turned and went into his house with no concern even for this. Huh. Poor Pharaoh. Uh, so what was hardened? Uh, he made up his mind. Uh, he uh, turned away spiritually. So it's interesting. Uh, the, uh, the heart seems to be a spiritual thing. Uh, uh, Second Corinthians 1, who sealed us and gave us the spirit in our hearts as a pledge. Okay, so spiritual life happens in the heart. So it's obviously something really, really important. Uh, where where the, uh, uh, the, the Holy Spirit lives is the heart. So what's the difference between the heart and the spirit? The Bible uses two different terms. Uh, yeah, so we're to assume that there's something going on, but what is it really? Here's another word that's important, conscience. Uh, these two on the right are to be assumed to be having an illicit 
uh, relationship. Uh, maybe they're making a movie or something. At any rate, the stoplight should be coming on uh, in uh, both of their heads simultaneously. That's, that's the conscience. The conscience, which is spelled incorrectly here. I just noticed that. Uh, conscience should not be spelled S-I-C, but S-C-I. Anyway, conscience is the witness within a man that tells him what he ought to do, uh, and what he believes is right, and not to do what he believes is wrong. Everybody has a conscience, uh, every human being. The term only appears in the New Testament. Uh, and the function of the conscience, it seems to be assigned to the heart in the Old Testament which is interesting. But the idea of everybody knowing something about right and wrong is clearly taught in the Bible. Uh, this is uh, uh, non-believers as well. Uh, the biblical terminology, mind, where does truth live uh, in our multifaceted person? The mind is more of a New Testament concept. We really don't have that in the Old Testament. I mean, people in the Old Testament had a mind, but we don't use the word. The functions of the mind parallel those of the heart. So there's intellect, emotion, and will all going on in the mind. Do not be conformed to this world, Paul says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I mean, the mind is obviously very important so that you may demonstrate experimentally what the will of God is, that it is good and acceptable and perfect. Uh, I've always liked Romans uh, 12 too, one of my favorite verses. Uh, but the functions of the mind are very similar to uh, what we see of the heart in both the Old and New Testament. Uh, so again, which is it? We go on a little further. Matthew 22, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and with all your mind, heart, soul, and mind. Okay. Uh, interesting that uh, uh, Jesus seems to have said it that way. The, uh, uh, the Old Testament uses the term spirit instead of mind. Uh, but anyway, here we go. First Peter 1. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So uh, your minds are prepared. You're sober in spirit. Your hope is fixed. Uh, so which is it? Mind, spirit, or hope? Well, it's all three. Uh, and uh, they are all related. They're different components of the same general area as we get started thinking about uh, life as a whole. Okay, a little more biblical terminology. Here's somebody supposed to be behaving in the flesh. I don't know what he's drinking, probably a Coca-Cola, but there it is. It looks bad. Usually this refers to the material part of man, but it can refer to the immaterial. Okay, there are two words in the New Testament, soma and uh, sarx. Uh, the term sarx is usually used by Paul in the New Testament to describe the sinful human nature, the desire to disobey God. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. Okay, the flesh seems to be generally uh, negative in the, uh, the New Testament. The flesh sets its desire against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another. Okay, so that doesn't sound good. And God condemned sin in the flesh. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Uh, life and peace. So here we have this kind of a picture. You've got man with a physical body. He's got a spirit that that lives inside of there, uh, and in the spirit is his mind, among other things. And there's an interface between the uh, between the the mind and the 
and the uh, and the body that Paul seems to call the flesh. Uh, and if if the mind is set on the flesh, all kinds of bad things happen. If the mind is set on the spirit, all kinds of good things happen. Uh, it's a Again, this is more complex uh, than uh, a simple dichotomy or trichotomy. Uh, there's, uh, there's more going on here. Okay. Uh, da, da, da. You're not even able to. Okay. Okay. That's, that's the discussion of the composition of man. Uh, my position is that man is complex. Uh, there, there's a whole lot going on. The biblical terminology supports the complexity or multifaceted nature of man. Uh, people who say there's nothing but body and soul or nothing but body, soul, and spirit are, in fact, oversimplifying what is a much more complicated set of ideas. For all practical purposes, we can think of man as composed of body and spirit, a material and an immaterial. That simplifies everything. But when we say that, and when we teach that, we also ought to realize that the Bible uses a whole bunch of different terms. Uh, and uh, that actually there are some theological issues. For example, this, uh, this, the use of the, the term flesh as an interface uh, between the spirit and the body, um, that, uh, that's a complex theological concept uh, that is worth exploring, and I'm not going to explore here. Uh, it's a uh, uh, it's an idea for explaining uh, why Christians still deal with sin in their lives uh, in a pure uh, dichotomous or trichotomous system. It's difficult to explain where sin comes from, but if we can have a more complex explanation, you see where I'm going. Uh, there's uh, ways of explaining and of diagnosing uh, the sin structure within our lives. And that turns out to be very helpful. Okay, let's move on to the, uh, uh, the next classic question. Uh, and this is the idea of the transmission of the immaterial part of me. Okay, the immaterial refers to soul, spirit, mind, heart, the whole thing, that which is not my body. My body obviously comes from uh, my mom and dad. Uh, you know, we all understand a little bit about genetics and how mom and dad contribute uh, their part. Uh, and so my hair color and uh, uh, my height and my body shape and that sort of stuff comes from my mom and dad. That's obvious. Well, where does the immaterial part come, the spirit or soul? Where does that come from? Uh, and uh, on this issue, there have been a lot of controversy as with just about everything all through the years. The pre-existence view suggests that a person's soul existed prior to conception. Uh, Plato thought that the soul existed before birth and continues after death. Uh, Aristotle, another Greek philosopher, thought that the soul perished at death. Uh, and they both, and they argued about this. And Hinduism teaches reincarnation. The, the soul moves through various bodies, various incarnations. Uh, the soul uh, is eternal and is a part of a, a part of the uh, the life force of all of existence, or something like that. Uh, very much like uh, the Force in Star Wars. Uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, out of this well of souls comes 
a life force for the newly conceived body. And so the, the soul is joined to a specific body for a bit of time, and then the body dies, and the soul just goes on to something else. So pre-existence. The Christian writer Origen, uh, who uh, died in 254, uh, thought that souls were created prior to the fall uh, and came to be embodied in people as a result of the fall, which is a very interesting idea. Uh, it's completely unsupported by scripture. It has nothing to do with scripture. I, I don't know where he got the idea. Uh, I suspect that he was reading an awful lot of Greek philosophy. But at any rate, uh, Origen is uh, very, very influential early uh, writer. So this idea uh, was uh, around. It was floating around in the early church. Uh, the notion of a pre-existence of the soul is absolutely not taught in the Bible. Uh, there's nothing even remotely like that in uh, in the Bible. Okay, so there is no pre-existent soul that is looking for a little bitty body to come an inhabitant. Uh, you know, an existing soul takes up residence to the body. That's not biblical. Uh, it, uh, it doesn't happen that way. A second view is uh, uh, called creationism. And this isn't the view that God created the heavens and the earth. This is the view that, that holds that at the time of human conception, God creates a brand new soul and unites it to the body. Uh, so uh, it, it's a, a separate act. Uh, the, the physical uh, existence of the body is due to mom and dad. But mom and dad have nothing at all to do with the soul, with the immaterial part. So the, there's, this brand new soul is created, I, I assume, in a big soul factory in heaven, and it's uh, shipped down to be united with the body. That's a just-in-time delivery uh, so that the... Uh, uh, <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm visualizing an assembly line uh, in, in, a, in a big uh, automobile factory in Milan or someplace uh, where, you know, the, uh, 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 the Ferrari engine is created uh, somewhere else and the, and the body comes from someplace. They all come together in this factory and are put together. Um, this is a view that was uh, was held by a lot of people over the years. Uh, Charles Hodge uh, was a famous 19th century uh, reformed theologian, uh, very influential. Matter of fact, I'm, I'm looking at my bookshelf right now. Yes, indeed, I have a copy of uh, Charles Hodge on, uh, on my bookshelf. I uh, haven't, haven't read him lately, but uh, I have Hodge on my bookshelf. He is amongst my mentors, in other words. And uh, this was a view held by a lot of important uh, evangelical scholars uh, over the years. He noted that God is called the father of spirits in Numbers 16.22 and again in Hebrews 12.9. Uh, he asked, how can the material body produce an immaterial soul? Okay, that's actually a good question. So creationism does not accord well with some Bible. For example, God finished his creative work on the seventh day. So if God finished it, uh, called it very good, how could he keep on creating? Uh, it doesn't quite make sense, uh, but there are ways around that. Hodge found some. Uh, humans, and this is the big problem, are born with original sin. Uh, that, that baby, newly conceived, this is a picture, I believe, of a seven-day-old uh, uh, uh baby in the womb. I, I have no idea how you get a picture like that. Uh, that's always amazed me. I, I love that kind of stuff. Uh, but the problem is, uh, 
the Bible says, in sin did my mother conceive me. So I, I, I ended up sinful in my mom's womb before I was born, before I'd done anything. Uh, I already had a sin nature. Uh, those of you who are parents may have noticed that it was never necessary to teach your children how to sin. Uh, they picked that up on their own. Uh, they, it, it seems to have been part of the original package uh, so that they, uh, uh, when they turned two, uh, they, they learned how to say no to everything. You know, that's why we call them the terrible twos. Uh, and we want them to go through that. That's an important part of their growing up. And of this, there's the separating from mom and dad. That it, it, it's really important. Uh, but it's still uh, that's sin. <laughs> and uh, after a while, they they learn to lie and they learn to cheat and they learn to steal and they do all these things. And we have to break them of those ha bad habits. Um, so the idea of a uh, of a new soul specially created for the assembly line uh, delivered just in time is not a biblical concept. It doesn't accord very well uh, with the Bible. Uh, Charles Hodge thought otherwise, but I think he's wrong on that. Okay. Uh, the third view that I'm going to introduce uh, is the most complex of all of the views uh, but it's the best approach to the biblical data. Uh, and we call this traditionism. Okay, this view suggests that the immaterial aspect of a human being is generated by the parents, just like the body. Uh, so my body came from my mom and dad and my spirit, complete with a sin nature, also came from mom and dad. This explains how mortality can be passed down to the entire human race from Adam. There really is no other explanation for that. Uh, this was first articulated by a Christian writer named Tertullian about 200 AD. Uh, he's the, uh, the earliest uh, Christian thinker to, to give us vocabulary uh, for this. Uh, and uh, he uh, gave us the word trad uh, tradux, uh, from which we get uh, traducianism. Uh, more recently, it was held by a character by the name of uh, W.G.T. Shedd, uh, a great theologian, 19th century. Uh, Psalm 51, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Uh, Psalm 51, and also parallel Romans 5, 12, uh, where uh, Paul talks about the transmission of sin through the human race, uh, as in Adam all sinned, so in Christ shall all be made alive. Okay, so that's, that's important. Okay. Oh, uh, don't dump, dump. Hebrews 7. Uh, actually gives us this very specific uh, statement for Abraham, who, by the way, paid tithes to Melchizedek. Okay, that's what Hebrew 7 is about. For Abraham was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Okay. Abraham was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek uh, met him. Uh, that shouldn't be Abraham, that should be Aaron. Aaron or Levi. Now that I'm thinking through Hebrews 7, uh, uh, because uh, the Hebrew 7 passage says that uh, Abraham is uh, uh, yeah, Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek and Levi and Aaron paid tithes to Melchizedek in the loins of their father, uh, Abraham. 
I hate using somebody else's PowerPoint presentation because I always miss something like this. <laughs> so anyway, uh, to be in the loins of his father is a very interesting idea because that, there it goes. That's a, a, a human uh, sperm and a human seed. That, that really is. That's a uh, uh, electron microscope uh, photograph. Uh, and uh, where is all that happening? Well, the, the Bible talks about the, the middle of your body as the loins. And, uh, uh, that's, that's, where, that's where Levi was uh, when Abraham met Melchizedek. Uh, and Melchizedek is greater than Aaron or Levi uh, because Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. Uh, interesting little, little bit there, but what traditionism says is that the soul is transmitted to the newly conceived individual by his parents. Uh, it's more complex uh, and we find that it's also uh, often difficult. Uh, and, uh, people have uh, have trouble with this, uh, but it's uh, uh, it's the best way to uh, to explain the existence of uh, the sin nature. Uh, uh, the best way to explain how the uh, 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 how the soul uh, can be tainted by sin throughout the entire human race. Uh, so that's why uh, most evangelicals today who have taken the time to think about it or uh, have uh, have studied this uh, accept the idea of traditionism uh, we're not not usually uh, pre-existence folks or uh, uh, soul creationist uh, folks okay uh, i'm watching the clock uh, the next lecture is over an hour long uh, so I'm going to have to, ouch, uh, I'm going to have to stop here. I know we're only about 45 minutes into it today, but I think we will stop here uh, and I will uh, pick up the lecture uh, on uh, original sin and uh, the sin nature in man uh, on uh, on Wednesday. That's, that's another, that's, that's the fun stuff. Okay. Uh, frankly, uh, I don't like talking about sin very much, but that's what we're going to do on, on Wednesday. So we will see you. Um, I'm going to unmute everybody, see if I can here. Uh, and uh, that will be it for today. We'll see you again at Wednesday, 8.30 at night. Uh, or 2.30 in the morning, wherever you happen to be. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll look forward to our time together then. Bye-bye, everybody. Love bye, you bye, all. Bye. 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 bye, guys. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Grazie, grazie. Bye. Ciao a tutti. Ciao a tutti. Ciao a tutti. Ciao.